So today I am going to talk to you on Bitcoins, the Bitcoin experience. So how many people here understand, know, heard about Bitcoins in the past? Quite a few. So how many people actually understand what is a Bitcoin? Half of the hands got down. And how many, many people actually have Bitcoins? Only me. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> okay. So when I heard about this Bitcoins, it was very hard to me to understand. I did not get it in the first. When I, when I, when I, start, I, I think the first time I encountered to see this in Forbes magazine, it did not get me. I tried to start reading, 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 but it did not get into my brain. And one day, my friend called me saying that, hey, uh, I'm doing this Bitcoin startup. So I need your feedback on this. Can you help me out? And then we went in one coffee shop and I was reviewing that particular thing. That's where, like, you know, uh, with my half knowledge on Bitcoins, I tried to evaluate that product. And then I bought it slowly. I started reading. It made me a little bit uh, interesting. And then I started attending some Bitcoin groups. So, if you want to understand what Bitcoins are, let's go back into the future. Let's understand the monetary system. So, I'm taking you back, you guys, to somewhere around 6000, 600 BC. So, 600 BC, how people used to transact, how people used to exchange, there is something called people used to follow bartering system. What bartering system means? People used to exchange either tools, food or livestock, lots of livestock for exchange in return. Let's say a person who has a chicken and a person, let's say a farmer who has an agriculture, foods and any kind of agriculture, he will exchange his chicken in form of, he will exchange his fruits. Same like that. But actually this system has a problem. The biggest problem with this system is, assume that like this person has a fish it has an expiry date. He can't hold that fish for a longer time, right? So what happens is, let's say, so there is other problem again. The other problem was, if a person don't want a fish, but this guy has a fish, so how can we exchange? His value go down. People say, I will not pay. So if I'm desperate of that particular good, if I want it, the price goes up. And then, in 600 BC, Coins came into existence in the form of exchange. These coins were form of different shapes, different metals, and different values all together. <coughs> in 806 AD, this paper currency came into existence in Tang Dynasty in China. Right? So this started from some of them were on the form of leather, some were on the plastic, some were on the paper, and Till now, till present, we have these existing of paper currency. In 331 BC, so people used to have trade access all the time, right? So for trade, basically, like you know, to carry all the stock or carry for the trade of business, taking gold is very difficult. So, so people used to basically write that particular money, say that they were order. So write an order that pay this guy so <coughs> Gold or whatever. And from 350 years, actually, British started this printed checks. So, even today, <coughs> we have this checks system, and slowly, slowly, because of this evolution of online system and instant transfers and all of this stuff, it's getting actually nobody is using checks. The gold standard, somewhere around 1816, England has actually started adapting money, their currency, to this gold standard. And 1900, US also started adapting to it. And right in that day, they decided not to follow, and they have their own system. And currently, at present, only few currencies, few countries follow this gold standard benchmarking, and not every country does it. In virtual currencies, and after that, a lot of innovation happened, right? So, you came into online, once the existence of internet, 
So a lot of this innovation happened and virtual currency came into picture. So what is a virtual currency? Virtual currency is a virtual money, which basically which has all the characteristics of money, but which basically sometimes it's, it has all the parameters of the money, but generally it's not, uh, it's basically created, but sometimes it's created by developers. And if you want to categorize these virtual, virtual currency, it can be categorized into three factors. One is closed system, other is old, open system, and the hybrid system. So in, in closed system, nothing to do with fiscal currency or fiscal services. Everything to deal with is virtual services. Whereas open system is all about fiscal money, fiscal services, and virtual <coughs> services. So let me show you some examples. So how many people remember this? <coughs> what does Mario game means is, so 100 points equals to one life, right? It's all virtual. So <coughs> semi semi model that is family. So what you can do is one day one, my wife said like you know I want a tractor. I said what? I said no I want a tractor. But my family is getting. Right. Then she said, no, it's virtual currency. Give me a credit card. I'm going to buy some points. Buy that. She can give you. So you're using physical currency to buy virtual services. Same with hybrid. So most of the times, these days, you see in any malls, there are like this children's play area, right? So in that children's play area, you pay physical money to get these points and play your game, if you win that particular game, you get these tickets. These tickets can be exchanged for, for prizes or sometimes cash. <coughs> so in hybrid, so generally like you know, most of the people fly in any of these air miles, right? Air miles or trade cards. When you spend something to get these miles, these miles can be exchange for other services or you can buy tickets. The same thing like you get for petrol miles and all of this stuff. This can be categorized as virtual <coughs> this thing. And there are in between like you know from 1990 to 2012. A lot of innovations happened and a lot of these currencies came into picture. These are the two currencies. But these are fair, including Facebook points and Microsoft points. <coughs> and then recently in 2009, we encountered something called bitcoins. What are these bitcoins? Who did it? So there is a person called Santoshi Nakamoto. No one knows him. So this guy really thought about the whole financial system. And he thought, he thought that like, you know, so why can't I create some virtual currency where actually like, you know, why does these banks get involved into that? And he created this eight page white paper and made sure, made it available to the developer community. And slowly from 2008 to 2009, so all these developers started looking into that and created this open source software called Bitcoin <coughs> Network. And today, if you see, one Bitcoin equals to $335, which is actually 21,000 bucks. So if you see this graph, so if you see from like you know last few years, so last, so it hit and it basically like one bitcoin was more than thousand dollars, and slowly, slowly I think like you know slowly fall down and suddenly currently it is somewhere around three fifty dollars. And how does it, how does the currency keep changing, fluctuating? So generally in regular financial segment. The regular money, it always depends upon the inflation thing. Here it's just like stock market, whereas it all depends upon uh, demand and supply. So, if you categorize both of them, centralized banks generally, it's centralized network it called. So, whatever transactions happens across 
it goes through bank. Whereas bitcoins, it decentralized, whereas it's also called as peer-to-peer -peer network. And the famous personalities like Bill Gates and Al Gore, who are really respected, think that this technology is awesome. <coughs> to understand bitcoins, there is something called mining. So these mining is a process of creation of a bitcoin. So these bitcoins, so basically let's say if you want to know about car, if you want to drive a car, you don't need to really understand how your car engine works, right? So because it's a little bit complex because it's totally based on cryptography and mathematics. <coughs> when a complex algorithm is solved, bitcoins get generated. So these bitcoins actually, uh, so there is an end date here. So it's not that like, you know, it keeps generating. 2140 is the last year that bitcoin gets generated. And whatever bitcoins generated in a lifetime is 21 million. These 21 million bitcoins keep <coughs> rotation across. So how many bitcoins mined till today? If you see this graph from something around 2009, so till now on an average of 12 million plus bitcoins in circulation today, as of today. And if you see this distribution chart, so there are around 28, 28.9 Person are with 47 individuals, and 880 individuals have 21.5.5 percent of bitcoins, and almost 20,000 individuals has 21.4 <coughs> percent, and more than 1 million individuals have rest of these bitcoins, and some of the bitcoins are lost in wallets. <coughs> what is a wallet? So wallet is nothing but basically wallet is the place where you store all your transactions. These transactions, so every Bitcoin has a wallet. Wallet is nothing but an address. So this is the huge, uh, this is your, any Bitcoin wallet has an address, which also represented by QR code. And you can, so if you, anyone want to send you, or if I want to <coughs> get Bitcoin, you need to send that address, which is very similar to, it's, it's only numbers because of cryptography. And transferring the Bitcoin, it's pretty simple. It's as simple as sending an email or by Bitcoin address. Two ways you can do it. And then you say if you want to send Bitcoins to someone, basically you say send money, give that particular address, and it also show you basically like you know how much Bitcoins you are sending, which also equivalent to value of what which currency. Rajiv, question. Um, so the wallet is a personalized storage device for the Bitcoin? Yeah, so there is a, uh, yeah, storage is a personalized wallet. Wallet is a personalized storage device. So wallets can be on phone, wallets can be on cloud, wallets can be on email, or wallets can be on your system. <coughs> Based on some people, so uh, some people want to make it secret, so they will keep it their own systems. Mm -hmm. Sometimes for cloud-based, it basically, like, you know, you can use any of these, uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, most of the exchanges which provides this online wallets where uh, it creates everything and it creates online wallet, you don't need a physical device for that. And that number, that serial number is the address of my wallet? Yes. So any Bitcoin address, wallet address will be pretty similar like this. And I'm going to show you my... Uh, or or does each coin have an address in my wallet? <laughs> no, each coin don't have an... each transaction has a... Uh, number and basically this is my fixed number whereas like you know how you have your email id so this is my id for my wallet where you i can track my transactions thank you okay so blockchain so what is a blockchain so here this concept is pretty interesting here in the bitcoins thing the, the concept here is basically if i send money to someone else if i send some money to someone else what happens is, I told you earlier, this is a peer-to-peer -peer decentralized network, right? So what happens is, it goes and updates to all the people. It goes and updates, it's basically like blockchain is nothing but, you can imagine as a public ledger, okay? 
okay so everyone can see it. there is no bank involved everyone can see who is transferring to whom your personal identity is not revealed but this wallet is sending money to this wallet everyone gets updated and it can't be <coughs> double transactions will never happen it's all transparent exchanges so there are 70 plus bitcoins in the market internationally so these these are our most of the most startups <coughs> these are basically what these exchanges does is either you can exchange your bitcoins and get money or you can, this allows to buy your bitcoins <coughs> buying in bitcoins it's pretty simple actually like you know what you it, this is one of the exchange which i use which is called coinbase so you go and link your bank account and say how many how much you want to let's say i want to buy 25 btc is for bitcoin i say like you no know, i want to buy 25 bitcoins and it tells you like you know your 25 bitcoins will cost you this much dollars and you link your whatever payment methodologies at the paypal or your all your credit card or your bank id and you can buy your Bitcoins immediately. <coughs> Same with payments. This Bitcoin is basically uh, it, it's open source software, and for merchants it's pretty easier. It's free for them. So WordPress, Joomla, Magento, any kind of frameworks. It's, this supports this thing. You can even for that case Blogspot, Blogger, everything. So you can just basically take that code, put it on your interface. It generate that bitcoins and you can keep sending. So you can have a valid limit of 15 minutes <coughs> and you can do the transactions. <coughs> and like this, like when you have this payment gateways in your shopping carts, you can have the bitcoin thing, keep accepting it. One question here. Yes. I want to buy one item which cost me $150. Okay. But the bitcoin uh, value is 350 something, right? Yeah. So how it's going to work? It's see one beauty about Bitcoin is Bitcoin is divisible infinitely. Okay, whereas like say you take one dollar, you can hardly divisible by hundred cents. Or like take a rupee, it can be hardly divisible by hundred paisa. But Bitcoin, you can it gets into micro level transactions. You can do it. I'm going to show that. So, <coughs> so what? See not. How do, let's say I want to buy something in Amazon. Can I buy it? Yes, you can buy it. So there are multiple ways. So you can uh, go to these sites like gift.com or some other dot coms where using bitcoins you can buy more than 200 plus payment cards. Like you have these cards, right? So Amazon card or CVS card or anything, you can go and do that. And recently, I think a couple of weeks back, PayPal actually started accept uh, uh, <coughs> planning it taking baby steps into accepting this uh, bitcoins thing and i think like in the future most of the people will come again and there are also bitcoins in the market uh, bitcoin atms in the market and there are also bitcoin ATMs, uh, atm cards and there are also bitcoin machines where a merchant can accept so instead of paying with your credit card you can just do this transaction with your uh, bitcoin thing and there are also various devices in your wallet devices available in the market where it basically use this NFC, near field communication technique where you can do this transaction directly. <coughs> this is a startup which I was talking about, which I was doing the UX review. So, so I think like, you know, let me show you a video than me talking on this. This is one which make me
discussion of your entering to the car over there. Okay? So without taking your hand from your steering wheel, you say like you want to do a gesture, the payment gets to get your fucking door open. Think about the power, think about the technological power. Yes, getting here. I mean I see you in the value of you, but why is it connected to why is it always connected to Bitcoin? I can I use any coin or any credit card, I can load some money into it and uh, pay you can, it. You can do that. Basically, like, you know, this is a valid, uh, these are basically devices which they are focusing more on. They believe that, on Bitcoins, they believe that Bitcoin has a future and future will change. Because it's an internet money transaction, uh, it's basically all digital thing. Bitcoin supports all the digital life transactions. Yeah. Uh, Ranjit, I don't know whether you are going to cover this. But how does one generate Bitcoins? Buying, I can understand. So, the same thing which we talked about earlier in the mining. So, it's basically Bitcoin gets generated by solving a complex algorithm. So, does it mean only the people who are into solving algorithms, mathematics? No, it's not. It's basically it's solved <coughs> by computing processing power. Okay, so cryptographers and generally mathematicians understands that you need that power to compute that solve the puzzle. Take it in. Let's think in that direction. There are something called big Bitcoin blocks. These blocks needs to be solved. So multiple super uh, supercomputer power. So there are also like a lot of startups who actually buy these Bitcoin hardware, all these processors, super jumbo processors, and basically their business is to just mine. They they burn this electricity and. It's all like you know, a little bit tough to understand. I think like you know, same thing I mentioned to drive a car, you don't need to understand how the engine works, right? So, Ran Ranji, just uh, do, do you know the cost to um, for the hardware? Hardware uh, just is to generate. Say, so generally, hardware point. is also pretty expensive. It's yeah. not that cheap. That's the reason they say that like you know, the value of one bitcoin to get generated is like you know, a lot of uh, power cost. See, generally they calculate this uh, California power price and also the processor cost because they can keep running all the 24 hours. And uh, these algorithms to be solved, yeah. are there some real life uh, problems? Which no, it's basically like, you know, this was, uh, this is <coughs> the whole uh, paper which like, you know, Santoshi Nakamoto, like, you know, pseudo guy, who created that, he really thought well and basically that's the reason people believe in that. Lot of thousands and thousands of thousands of developers <coughs> And a lot of economists really believe in that. But banks don't believe it, that's a separate thing. <laughs> but uh, there is something in that, that's the reason there is that much following. And uh, there is something called uh, from February 2011 to 2013 of July, okay, there is a website called Silk Road. This is very well known for, like, uh, under, it's also called like underground of. Amazon and eBay kinds basically like you know for selling these illegal drugs Okay, and I don't know what are the underground thing is but like you know they keep selling it So what FBI did is FBI sees that particular site and they hand over all these this thing and out of that 9.5 million transaction happened with bitcoins So bitcoins are used they're using bitcoin for buying all this because like you, know, you can't trace that people right You can on this and what this uh, US government did is after that, they auctioned all these bitcoins and there were almost 60 to 70 bidders came into this thing and finally the highest, it was given to the highest bidder is actually like you know one of the famous VC in Bay Area called Tim Trapper who really, it's a, who is actually a great believer of uh, bitcoin startups, who funds all bitcoin startups and <coughs> if you see this not every country accepts bitcoins as of now and <coughs> this was banned in China and Thailand it was a lot of blood. <laughs> and USA and Canada set some regulations and stuff and actually Germana, Germany keep doing the taxes on it if you do a big tag, a big a bitcoin transaction and you bought money and you need to pay taxes on it and it's an open source software right like you know, if you create a website there are hundred duplicates right same thing happened to bitcoins bitcoin is a software it's a it's also called as linux money you know linux right so there are almost 70 plus different alternative currencies came into picture this is also based on cryptography maybe like different softwares yes Giri. Uh, if you are in us and i'm in india and if you send me bitcoin india's government is not going to tax me but germany is going to tax me uh, 
No, basically, until and unless you do it in Bitcoin, I don't think so. Basically, still governments are unclear about uh, Bitcoins. They are still thing, setting up the uh, this thing because the, the whole adoption is pretty fast, so it take, it's taking time. So, but all governments are pretty serious about it. So have a panel. So even India RBI has a whole panel, which basically seriously thinking about Bitcoins. The biggest threat for RBI is basically a lot of money laundering happening can happen with this. Like, how do they tax? Let's say you are sending, uh, let's say I am sending from money from US to India. How does the government tax? That's a bigger problem, right? So they are actually thinking about how to solve that problem. See, because it's all about user adaption. When people are accept, accepting it, right, it gets popular. You can't stop it, it's very difficult to stop. Let's say <coughs> earlier in 96, 95, how many people has a website? How many people have an email? Now, can you stop anyone having an email? It's very difficult without internet. It's very difficult because every day, day to day, life is totally linked with internet, right? These days. So, same like that. So, out of all those, Bitcoin. So, let me start thinking about this. I started thinking about, okay, Bitcoins. So, let's take an example of Facebook Like. What does Facebook Like mean? It's not need anything, so we keep liking, right? Oh, mom, um, I'm sad today, like, I'm going to trick today, it's like, okay? This is my photo, try, like, my graduation, like, I'm getting boring, the girlfriend writes, like, what does that mean? So you have this, let's take an example of this rice bucket challenge, which basically made what very popular from rice bucket challenge, right? So. Instead of people liking, like, you know, like, 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 like. So what if a transaction, like, you know, micro transactions, you can do a Bitcoin. One like equal to some point of fraction of a Bitcoin. It's a money. It's a donation, right? Yes. People will like it, it gets donated. Same thing, like, you know, we recently did a <coughs> spacecraft on Mars. If people, the same thing, people was tweeting, sharing, and all of this stuff. Imagine. The same tweet equals to some point fraction of something. You get donation for to put one more fraction on another planet. Is it right? Right. So for anything, it stands like you know, let's talk about positives. So there's a payment freedom and very low space. You can send money to any any place to any place. And very few ways to for merchants. And you have security and control. It's transparent. And you can do multiple uh, <coughs> microtransactions and it's global, globally accepted. If I want to send two dollars to Africa somewhere in Nigeria, I can do it with Bitcoin. Whereas if I want to do it from a bank transaction, I should pay thirty dollar as a transaction <laughs> fee. <laughs> so, and negatives. There are definitely negatives on this. Is <coughs> one is basically acceptance. There is not much acceptance. Second, vulnerability. Third one is, if you lost your wallet, your bitcoins are lost. That's it. No one can do anything. And price stability. You don't know when it goes up, when it goes down. It's not in the, because of market fluctuations. <coughs> and no buyer protection, let's say. So there is no protection and lack of regulations. So if you see this whole link, try to connect all this dot from UX perspective. The biggest challenge is, I think is, one is difficult to understand. And it's based on mathematics and cryptography. It's difficult to understand. I can't explain my mom what is a Bitcoin is. What, in fact, like, you know, I can't even explain what a virtual currency is. And it's pretty long. Look at this address. It's difficult for me today to remember my telephone number. Right? My computer 20 plus digits. Crazy, right? And not everyone believes digital currency. <coughs> and there are multiple Bitcoin wallets, right? Each UI looks different and behaves very differently. And governments are very unclear about BTC. It challenge very challenges for illegal usage because it's has high value. It's basically anonymous. It's pretty difficult, basically. There is most of chances chances that all this stuff happens. And and a lot of people are unclear in terms of like you know they don't know what to do with bitcoins and 
And one more biggest thing is because I told you, Bitcoin network is a big software, and it's still on beta. Okay, it's still a lot of, every day a lot of check-ins keep happening on the core base, and it's still on beta. It's, it needs to be stabilized. And there's some point of because like, you know tons and tons of developers are actually writing code on that, <coughs> and it's a newbie. It's pretty few years old, and <coughs> can't predict. The biggest problem which I see from a UX perspective. And from my personal perspective is, this is my biggest problem, okay? So, there is a transaction which I need to happen at, for 69, 70 rupees transaction, 69 rupees, let's say my auto bill is 69 rupees. I, I'll just give you, I'll give 70 rupees and just walk out. No change, that's all. But here, this coin transaction also matters, because coin <coughs> Bitcoin equals to 20,000 plus. When the coin transaction, may ended up more than 2,000 or 3,000, right? <laughs> so that is one thing. And <coughs> if you start looking at the whole Bitcoin thing, what I personally think is, it's still, it's still a newbie. It's still basically like, you know, in terms of still like a how internet was in 96, it's still like that in the very steps. I think it's a opportunity for a lot of startups to actually create businesses on this Bitcoin network and a lot of startups are actually doing it. And it's an open source initiative. So anyone can actually, like, you know, it's a, a 10 developers has an idea, form a group and actually create their code and check it. Or basically they can review the code or they can create businesses around on it. And, and it's also opportunity for governments actually, like, you know, they're actually governments are actually seriously thinking about this Bitcoin. So how to regulate this and how to put like regulations on the top of this, how to actually like you know avoid this negativity of this, or how to actually safeguard this, or maybe how to tax money on this so that the government gets money. And from UX, actually for developers and designers, cryptocurrency, cryptography, actually it's a new domain, brand new domain. People who have knowledge on cryptography get more jobs. Because when I went to one of the Bitcoin meetups, so people were asking, like, you know, okay, I'm looking for designers and developers who understand cryptography because, <coughs> because this is so complex and it's all virtual and you need to deal with interfaces. The UX plays a more biggest, biggest, biggest role in this particular thing. Being said, personally, I want to be neutral whether it's good, whether it's bad or something, but looking at this whole technology, whole the way of mining of Bitcoins, I'm really excited. And I think, like, you know, a lot of innovation keeps happening. It's all new, like, you know, we saw a lot of innovations from, like, you know, <coughs> going to school, uh, going to people, the children going to school from books, and now people are going with iPads, right? And like, you know, so tomorrow they'll be the Apple Watches. And we don't know, <laughs> things are going very drastically. And I'm really excited with that. And I think after some point of time, it gets more secure. Everyone's government keeps regulating it. And this will become an alternative currency. So thank you very much. <laughs>